Welcome to the Jimmy Lloyd Songwriter Showcase. I'm your host, Jimmy Lloyd. We're taking the show on the road, so to speak, out of the controlled environment of the Gibson Guitar Showroom and into live venue settings. Tonight we're here at the Highline Ballroom. On this episode, we'll be featuring Michael Imperioli along with his band, La Dolce Vita. Jeffrey Lewis will also be joining us. We're going to explore a little bit how songwriters approach their live performances. We're here with Jeffrey Lewis, the Bard of Brooklyn, at the Highline Ballroom, where tonight Jeffrey will be headlining this evening's festivities. Now, Jeffrey, uh, this is your first uh, large New York City gig in quite a while. Um, what goes through your mind uh, ahead of a performance uh, this big? Uh, just trying to figure out what to play, as usual. I'm a uh, obsessive when it comes to trying new songs that aren't quite ready to be performed on stage yet. So just sorting through lists of stuff. And also, I'll be playing with my old friend Spencer on mandolin. So it'll be, uh, you know, kind of a, a mix and match thing. New material, old material, stuff I know how to play, stuff I don't know how to play. Mm -hmm. Your songs are extremely, uh, very powerfully lyrically driven. What do you ascribe as, some of, uh, ascribe as some of your influences in terms of the development of your, your style? Well, I always felt like content was going to be an important part of me making music. I'm much more of a perhaps more of a writer than of a musician. I have a hard time calling myself a musician, although it's essentially been my job for a number of years. You could sort of throw a rock in New York City and hit somebody who's a better singer than I am, certainly, somebody who's a better musician than I am, and uh, probably somebody who's a better interviewee than, than I am. But um, I always felt like music, to me, needs to have a certain nutritional content, and I, I like to just pack my songs full of nutrition. And dribs and drabs at a time Creatures started to hop up through the no, oceans. My songs are about something, which is doesn't sound like that much, but uh, it's more than a lot of songs out there. Jeff, one of the things that strike me uh, about your songs is just the sheer uh, length of them. They're, they're, there's lots of words. I mean, I think in uh, Williamsburg, Will Oldham Horror, uh, you cover just about every aspect of Western civilization in one form or another. How do you? simply remember all the lyrics to some of your songs. Well, plenty of times I don't, and tonight will probably be no exception to that rule. I'm in some ways very influenced by my uncle, who is a rapper. He goes by Professor Louie, and he's probably among the preeminent um, socialist Jewish rappers in Brooklyn over the age of 60. Um, it's a wide field, but he's on top of it. And I've just been seeing his show since I was a little kid, and obviously very word-oriented, being a rap spoken word sort of thing. And I do, however, it's interesting to me that the songs of mine that people gravitate towards are the lengthier ones, and it becomes awkward because they're not the ones that are necessarily the most fun to play. You know, people in the audience are yelling out for songs that are seven, eight minutes long. If I start playing something and within a minute I realize maybe this was a mistake to launch into, I'm stuck in that song for another eight minutes. What song are you, are you proudest of? Which one of your uh, creations? The early batch of songs that I wrote when I first started doing this back in like 97, 98 had a certain innocence to them that's really hard to get back to as a writer because there's something that happens mentally when you're writing stuff that you don't necessarily think people are going to hear, at least not in quantity, you know, beyond a couple of friends. And nowadays, writing stuff, there's this knowledge that it's going to be heard by an audience at some point. So that early batch, uh, Heavy Heart, is a song that I'm really proud of. Very simple. Um, Just another out of mind and out of sight. Or Life is another one of the early batch. They're songs that I, I don't think I could write nowadays because I'd, I'd, get, I'd write a couple of lines and then I'd picture myself singing it in front of people and probably get too embarrassed to go further. Mm -hmm. They're very direct and kind of emotionally naked in, in a way that I, I uh, maybe you lose as you get overexposed. Mm -hmm. Do you find that um, your comic book illustrations influence your songwriting or vice versa? I, I keep a page in the back of my sketchbooks that is like sort of the idea page and then anytime something a little line or an image comes to me I'll, I'll just sort of jot it down there and sometimes it'll end up in a comic book and sometimes in a song mm -hmm. and 
they sort of could go either way. I, I do sometimes have in mind that I'm going to illustrate something when I write it, but that could be a song as well because I have these illustrated songs where I'm like I'm singing and I'm showing drawings that go with it. So there's a, a certain amount of crossover. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't necessarily uh, keep them that separate. Now you've toured all over the world. Uh, what's one of the most bizarre experiences that's happened to you at a, at a live performance? Oh man, many bizarre experiences. Um, it's a big question. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, getting attacked on stage is always interesting. Has that happened? Oh, sure. Um, and getting... Uh, Did you offend somebody? Oh, yeah, if I offend people all the time, I'm, uh, you know, it's, a, it's controversial, these, <laughs> these things. I, I've, uh, yeah, a, n a number of stalkers around the world who cause problems in, in various locations. Um, and then, of course, you know, we tour as a band in, a, in a punk rock style, which I've been a fan of doing even when our career got to the point where we could afford hotels, it's just so much more interesting staying in people's houses <laughs> everywhere. You know, but then you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. So it, it just makes it more of an adventure rather than just a, a sort of yeah. sterile, uh, you know, predictable touring situation. What makes Jeffrey Lewis cringe? Oh, man. Uh, being interviewed, uh, <laughs> having people look at me, having people listen to me. Um, you're like a Petri dish of neuroses. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a living. <laughs> Uh, geez, yeah, you know, that's, that is the thing, it's like being, being the center of attention is, you know, it's nice, it's flattering. Well, this didn't happen by accident, right? You've, been, you've worked pretty it's, hard at this. Yeah, but not in the way that I feel like people that work hard at it work at it. I just kind of figured, you know, I'd play some open mics and make these tapes of my songs and they would just get out there if people mm -hmm. liked the songs. And it's just spread further than I intended. I always wanted to be a comic artist, and comic artists are blissfully anonymous. You know, you sit at home, you do your stuff, people read the comics, but nobody knows who you are as a person, yep. and you're free to walk the streets. And um, the music thing's just taken off so much more than the comic thing that, um, you know, I doing, uh, getting cameras around you. I, you know, I'm not a model. I, I wasn't in this to like have people look at me. I find myself on stage wondering what I need to do with my face, with, like, yeah. what I need to do with my body. Should I be moving more? So, you know, I, I think the songs, if they're important to me, I hope they're also going to be important to somebody else out there. And that is the extent of it. I, I don't feel like I need to call attention to myself in a, in a visual sense. I, you know, uh, I, I think that me as a uh, as a me is not what the you know is not an important part of the equation. Well, Jeff, well, we're looking real forward to your performance tonight. I'm sure you're going to just knock them dead. Uh, best of luck tonight. Thanks a bunch. Same to you. Well, we're here backstage at the Highline Ballroom with uh, Michael Imperioli and La Dolce Vita. Michael, you are very well known as a successful uh, film and television actor. It's probably not as well known that you are an accomplished songwriter as well. Uh, how long have you been involved in music and in songwriting? Well, accomplished is a relative term, so I don't know. That's in the eye of the beholder, I guess. Um, how long have I been involved in, in this band? We've been, we've been together for four and a half years. Um, and uh, it's really, it's a very collaborative, well, I should introduce the band first. Yeah, so sure. You know who I'm talking. This is Olmo Tai, Hi. who plays drums and also sings, and Elijah Hamilton, who Hello. plays bass and also sings and writes. We all write together. What are some common themes that you tend to come back to in your, in your songwriting? Um, you know, I, I try to write about things that touch me the most, you know. Um, some of them are very tragic things that maybe I don't want to process in other ways, and I find this way a good way to process it. Um, some are about things that, um, things that, uh, the way I look at life, you know, and what it means to be alive and things, and try to put the, those kind of, you know, abstract, difficult questions into uh, a tangible form in the music. Now, when you guys got together, did you find that you had a lot of common influences, or were you from a whole bunch of different uh, different backgrounds musically? Both. I think we 
we both have a lot of common in influences together, but um, I think that we all have things that we've introduced each other to that we might not have known about beforehand. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your biggest influences growing up? What did you like to listen to? The Beatles were my first big, and uh, I loved Queen when I was a kid. The first album I ever bought was Queen, Night at the Opera. And um, those were my big ones when I was a kid. But then, you know, um, as an adult, the New York rock scene really had a big influence on me. Like mm -hmm. the um, CBGB scene and uh, Max's Kansas City scene, mm -hmm. like Velvet Underground, obviously, and Lou Reed. and More Lou Reed than the Velvet Underground, actually. Um, yeah, I've read that, that you're a very big Lou Reed fan. Have you ever had yeah. the chance to meet him? Yeah, yeah. We're actually, you know, friendly. And uh, he um, he was practicing where we were practicing one night and, and played us some interesting, like, he was doing the metal machine music stuff and he was playing some for us one night. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Man. Very cool, yeah. He's a really cool guy. Lou Reed's a really cool guy. <laughs> he hasn't seen us play, but yeah, he, he's heard about us. <laughs> Is there something about like abstract or kind of freeform uh, lyrical style that particularly appeals to you? You know, it's it's hard to say. Sometimes you know something can be narrative, and sometimes something can be very specific. But sometimes abstract things really work. Um, um, you know, sometimes the cut cut and paste technique, you know, like William Burroughs did, um, can really be effective. And you can have a part that uh, or lines next to each other that have nothing to do with each other, but somehow in the context of the song, mm -hmm. um, it makes sense. I get the impression that uh, back in the days of LPs, you may have been one of those guys that would like actually read the uh, the liner notes the lyrics along with the uh, along with the album as it's playing is that is that the case yeah I mean the, the LP the actually having something that big to hold in your hands and to look at was really there was like a kind of talismanic thing about it and um, just would stare at it and read everything on it and look at the pictures because that was the only way you really knew about who this band was because mm -hmm. you, you know you weren't googling you know Queen, Before Google, find out who Freddie Murray, you know, nothing. It was just like the picture and the lyrics, and you read what instruments they played, and try to kind of put together who these people were. There was something I think a lot more mysterious about them uh -huh. in that way. Now, as a drummer, um, who are some of your biggest influences? I guess John Bonham, and I like a lot of reggae drummers, and I like um, who else? I like Tiki Fullwood from Funkadelic. There's a lot. The drummer from Mars Volta is good. He's great. He's incredible. And uh, the bass man? Yeah. Who'd you like uh, in your formative years? Well, um, Paul McCartney, John Entwistle, James Jamerson, uh, you know, all the heavyweights, I guess. I like Cool Bell from Cool and the Gang. Basically, anyone who, who can kind of come up with a counter melody, you know, something catchy and still stay in the pocket. and drive it rhythmically too, you know. Um, I like the guy from Fleetwood Mac, actually. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the sound of your band? It's, um, it was hard in the beginning when we weren't as tight, but now we have more freedom to be looser, be slower if we feel like it. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning it was louder, so we still have some of that element. But it's mostly New York sound, I guess. That's what other people say. I call it New York rock. New York rock. Which is very general, but I mean, yeah, that's I don't, I don't really know how to describe it. Yeah. What are some of your uh, recent uh, compositions? Some of your recent songs that you're particularly uh, proud of and you like to play live? Um, tonight we're doing a, a song um, that's about. It's really about kind of about the Dalai Lama and, and his fleeing from Tibet in 1959, and we actually have a. Um, a well-known Tibetan singer who's going to um, perform that song with us mm -hmm. and sing part of it in Tibetan, mm -hmm. and, and I sing part of it in English. Well, from what I've seen, uh, from uh, what I've seen of your music and of your performances and the sound check, and uh, from what I've seen online and from what I've heard, you, you definitely have what I would consider a social conscience in your songwriting. I think it comes across in your performances as well. Um, how important is um, the big picture to, to you personally and also as a band in terms of what's going on in the world? Well, I'm, I, I, it's hard to separate, you know, what's going on in the world from them, what's going on with you because, you know, the world is such a 
it's it's a lot smaller now, you know, and what affects everyone affects us, and it's, you know, um, so I, I think that I find it using music a, a way to somehow express how you feel about things. I mean, it's not not that's I don't really write necessarily overt political things that you know I try to you know proselytize or whatever the people <laughs> or anything but um but definitely when things on the outside and you know outside meaning not from my own brain but the world try to um try to find a way to you know use music to express your feelings about them are you uh do you ever get nervous on stage are you comfortable in your role as a as a front man um I still do get nervous yeah which is uh that's yeah. interesting because as accomplished as you are as as an actor, both in uh, again in television, film, and on stage, it's interesting that when it comes to putting your own music out there, that 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 may potentially happen. Why do you think that is? Is it because you're exposing a side of yourself that maybe no, other no, see? it's more about live performance. I mean, like I've been I've acted in plays since I was like 18 years old, but I still it's still terrifying. You know, I hear that about a lot of actors. I know Al Pacino, who does plays all the time, you know, and has done it for how many years, is, gets, you know, crazy nervous before he goes on stage. It's that whole thing about, you know, whether you're putting yourself out there as an actor or as a, 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 as a musician, doing it in front of people, you know, is, is, a, is a trip that way. Yeah. You know, it's different than you do a movie and you go to the premiere and everyone's watching you on you know, you don't ha you're not performing it anymore, you're just kind of yeah. watching it. It's, it's very different than actually creating it live. Absolutely, and you can, you can write the song in the, in the, uh, the, the quiet of your, your bedroom or your, or your living room, but the song definitely takes on a, a different dynamic when you take it to the, take it to the streets, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Where do, you, uh, where do you foresee La Dolce Vita going? Where do, where do you want to take this? Well, we have a, a lot of material that we haven't recorded, so... Um, that's the next thing we're going to do and um, I'd love to go on the road a little bit with some and open for some cool bands and uh, more of that and keep writing new material and well, it's great to meet you guys obviously familiar with your work uh, you. it's nice to meet you guys and we absolutely wish you the best of luck thanks a lot thanks appreciate it. thank you for having us I appreciate it thanks for being here A turn of fate Tonight I could create If you still believe in all those stories You lie in wait
What makes a great song? It's a chant, an anthem, a sense that there's something more out there. It's a feeling deep down in your bones that something just isn't right and that something's gotta give. Maybe you like Kiss, maybe it's Voivod, maybe it's some other form of interstellar heavy metal space music. If you're a songwriter in the tri-state area and you'd like to appear on this program, send a link to your music to Songwriter Showcase at JimmyLloyd.tv. If we think you have what it takes, then maybe you can appear here on the Jimmy Lloyd Songwriter Showcase.